지금 이 행사는요, 어, 페이스북을 통해서 생중계될 예정입니다. 그래서 여러분들 페이스북, 어, K정책 미디어랩 페이스북을 통해서 어, 지금 생중계될 예정인데요. 지금 준비를 하기 위해서 앞에 나와 계신데요. 잠시 후에 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 카메라 팀께서는 다 준비가 되시면 말씀해 주시기 바랍니다. 네, 감사합니다. 네, 오늘 모두 연사들께서 앞에 와 계신데 여러분 큰 박수로 예, 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 오늘 사회를 맡은 오주영입니다. K정책 미디어랩과 하버드 버크먼 클라인 인터넷 및 사회센터가 공동 주최하는 인공지능에 나아가야 할 정책과 규범의 방향성에 관한 국제 심포지엄을 시작하겠습니다. 큰 박수로 한번 축하해 주시기 바랍니다. 특히 오늘 이 자리는 K정책 미디어랩의 설립을 기념하며 개최되는 행사로 다보스 포럼을 비롯한 유럽과 아시아 퍼시픽 지역의 AI 전문가들이 한자리에 모여서 새로운 형식과 비전을 제시하는 토론 모델이 될 것입니다. 오늘 장소를 제공하신 위워크 역시 열린 코워킹 스페이스 기관으로 우리가 나아가야 할 4차 산업의 융합적 협력을 <웃음> 공간적으로 표현하여 보여주신 곳이기도 합니다. 오늘 위워크에도 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 간단하게 행사의 진행을 소개해 드리겠습니다. 19대 국회의원과 다보스 포럼의 아시아 국장을 역임한 K정책 미디어랩 대표 이재영 대표가 좌장을 맡겠습니다. 그리고 단일 케어미 세계경제포럼 정보기술 및 전자사업부장의 4차 산업혁명 시대 인공지능의 보안과 안정성이라는 주제의 기조연설 후 얼스 가서 하버드대학교 로스쿨 교수이시며 버크먼 클라인 인터넷 및 사회센터장을 역임하고 계신 얼스 가서 교수님과 K정책앤 미디어랩 상임 고문이시며 일본 게이오대학교 종합정책학부 명예교수이신 미치오 우메가크 교수님 이두 분을 모시고 함께 오늘의 주제인 인공지능에 나아가야 할 정책과 규범의 방향성에 관한 4차 산업의 사례를 예시로 들어 문제 제기와 나아가야 할 방향을 모색하는 토론이 진행될 예정입니다. 또한 이 퍼블릭 세션이 끝난 후에 3시부터 6시까지 이루어지는 비공개 심포지엄은 K정책 미디어랩과 하버드대학의 <웃음> 버크먼 클라인 센터 포 인터넷 소사이어티와 공동 주최하여 AI에 관한 아시아 국가들의 초점을 맞추어 비교 관점으로 윤리와 규범, 정책에 관하여 미국, 유럽, 한국, 싱가폴, 일본, 중국, 대만의 정부, 기업, 학계 대표들 40여 명이 모여 라운드 테이블 형식 토론회를 진행하게 됩니다. 현재 AI에 관하여 어떤 문제를 직면하고 있는지 아시아 국가들 간의 문화적 특성을 고려하여 사회 각 분야가 나아가야 할 방향을 모색하는 토론회가 될 것입니다. 이재영 대표님께서 이제 네 어, 이렇게 그 바쁘신 와중에 그 어, 이 자리에 오신 여러분들 감사합니다. 그 어, 
저는 그 KGM 랩 연구의 소장인 윤한나입니다. 멀리 그 유럽에서 어, 다니엘 그리고 또 하버드 대학 관련 음, 여러분들 오셨고요. 그리고 어, 비공개 섹션에는 싱가포르, 중국, 그리고 어, 일본, 그리고 대만 이런 그 어, 기업 그리고 정부 관련 어, 전문가들이 저희 어, 섹션 그 심포지엄에 오셔서 음, 여러 AI에 관해서 그 말씀을 나눠주실 겁니다. 그리고 오늘 기조 연설 맡아주시는 어, 다버스 포럼의 다니엘 씨 그리고 하버드 대학의 가서 교수님 그리고 제 목요일 그 개요 대학의 은사이신 음메가키 어, 교수님 함께 하여 주셨고요. 그리고 저희 대표 대표 <웃음> 저희 연구소 대표 이재영 씨 함께 하십니다. 네그 AI 관해서 어. 에, 그 나아가야 할 정책과 어, 방향성 그것을 여러분들 그 90분 굉장히 짧지만 어, 뜻깊은 시간이 될 거라고 생각됩니다. 네 함께 해주시고 끝까지 어, 들어주시길 바랍니다. 그러면 저희 대표 이재용 씨 <웃음> 이어서 말씀 부탁드립니다. 네 반갑습니다. 어, 19대 국회의원을 지내고 아, 지금 방금 우리 한나 씨가 소개해 주신 KGM 랩 정책 미디어 랩의 대표로 맡고 있는 그리고 또 19대 국회의원 지낸 이재영입니다. 반갑습니다. 네, 지금 동시 통역이 되고 있기 때문에 지금부터는 어, 실력은 별로지만 그래도 영어로 진행을 좀 하도록 하겠습니다. 양해해 주시기 바랍니다. So, uh, let us start our session. Um, so let me do the reintroduction of our great panels that we have. And actually, before we start, I really want to thank two very, very uh, thankful groups. One is that uh, DIMA, uh, Donga Institute of Media and Arts, uh, they have provided all this uh, media setting so that all the audience from through the Facebook and YouTube can uh, see this thing live, as well as we will have recorded uh, this session and put it up on our website so that you guys can always come back and watch this session again. And also, we're gonna, we also have to really, really thank uh, the people and staff at WeWork uh, because this, I think having our session at this very innovative space is a great opportunity. I think it's very well fit together, uh, but at this, WeWork staff has worked tremendously and very hard so that this session and this space can be provided to us. Um, so anyways, let me start the uh, session by actually introducing people. Right next to me, uh, Mr. Daniel Keremi is actually a former colleague of mine from the World Economy Forum. He's now the director of information and community technology, so he knows everything, and supposedly he knows everything about artificial intelligence. So. At the end of the session, if you have any questions to him, please don't be afraid to ask any questions. <laughs> he should be able to answer anything. Next to Daniel is Professor and Professor and Dr. Urs Gasser. Uh, he is the executive director at Harvard University Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Actually, this session, uh, this public session as well as a private session, is put together by mostly the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, this is the first part of the global dialogue series that uh, the Harvard University has put together and you know, URS has put together uh, that will continue throughout the year. And hopefully at the end of this year, after all series of this AI dialogue, we'll have a very extensive and great report uh, for the public. And next to uh, Dr. URS, uh, Gesser, is of course our Professor Michio Umegaki uh, from Keio University. He's a professor of political science and Faculty of Policy Management. Um, Professor Umegaki is, I think, is great uh, inclusion for this panel because while these two gentlemen knows really a lot about AI and technology and the direction of it, Professor Umegaki will actually provide us an insight of what does it really mean for general public, for you and me who doesn't know anything about AI. So 
I think this uh, panel and at the end of the session, we will have a great or a better understanding of what artificial intelligence means for our society. So let me uh, first start with a question to Daniel. I believe, Daniel, you have uh, something to show on the screen. Uh, Yes, thank you very much, Elliot. Good afternoon and a great pleasure to be here. I just thought because we're talking a little bit about the fourth industrial revolution as a concept, I, I thought I will show a very short video before we actually uh, go in deep dive into AI. Okay, yeah. let us see the video. It's all right. If you go, you go on any run and there. Okay, well, you know, I think we're having technical difficulty of showing the right video, so we'll actually stop it here. So you can go on to say, it's just right. It, the, the live presentation will be much better than just the video one. Okay. <laughs> this is the beauty of having the live session, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so I actually, I have a question for you, right? So, Daniel, we actually talk a lot about artificial intelligence in Korea, and especially with the AlphaGo last year with beating one of very famous, you know, Asian chess player, um, that this became a sort of fathom in Korea, and a lot, about it, a lot of people talk about artificial intelligence and what the technology means. Since you are the head of the industry, uh, could you please tell us how fast is artificial intelligence is actually being developed in Silicon Valley, and if there is any uh, technological aspect that we don't know about uh, that is very secret to maybe to the Valley only, uh, maybe you can reveal some of these secrets. So first of all, uh, welcome to my world. I don't really play Go, but I do play chess. <laughs> and what you experienced last year, we experienced about 10 years ago when, when uh, uh, the, the, the artificial intelligence at that time would, would, was the best, defeated the best chess player. Um, so that's ever since I kind of gave up on my professional dreams of becoming a professional chess player and decided to do what I do now. But I understand that this is a transformation that is taking place here um, in Korea today. It will only get faster. It, the examples will only become more abandoned. Um, and just to answer um, Jae Young's question, I, I would like to clarify that the, the interesting thing is that the, uh, all the amazing innovations do not always come from the Silicon Valley. A lot of it does but it actually comes from the global ecosystem. And that's the whole point, and I'm delighted that, uh, that Urs will be talking about it, the, the, the Harvard's Global AI series, because the conversation needs to happen at a global level. We cannot just have a segmented conversation dedicated just to the Valley or to Seoul or to Israel or to any other parts of the world. Now, I think what's... Uh, the, uh, the, the technology always progresses in a very fast way. Uh, Jae Jung talked about technology, society, and government. If you think about it, technology moves at the, at the speed that is faster than the other two. Then societal norms catch up to the technological advancements, and finally regulations and laws come in at the very end of this process. And that's okay that this, is, this, this proceeds in that way, because the government cannot be acting too fast, because the government needs to be very balanced in terms of the approach it takes. What I can tell you is that there's a lot of excitement among the technology community about the possibilities of AI. There's also a lot of uh, concern about w where the technology may go or not go because of the societal backlash to the early uh, manifestations of the technology. So many tech leaders actually would like to, to, to skip the whole notion of AI, artificial intelligence, and talk a little bit more about you know, cognitive abilities of the machines or machine-to-machine -to -machine learning or some such segment of this broader phenomena. Um, one thing that they always bring up is the rather than AI, we should be talking about IA, which is intelligent assistant. 
So basically, how do you, how do you skip this notion of a terminator and robots taking over our jobs? You know, us being too scared from, from these technological advances to, to perhaps <coughs> new, unadjusted social norms, and actually talk in terms of how it can enhance our human abilities in the areas that not necessarily, um, you know, that natural for us. Do you, um, for example, do you remember any phone numbers of the people you contact these days? I remember my wife's. That's about it, right? Yeah, I, I, well, I need to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, but, you know, I don't even remember that anymore because okay. you, know, you, just, you, just, you just get used to the fact that the, you know, it, it will always be there. Tech right. will always be there. You don't necessarily need to know the facts. You don't necessarily need to. There's always a, a, you know, when I was a student, many of you here are students, I remember I read pretty much every English language textbook in my <laughs> library. There were not that many. Um, now, right now, it would be impossible. Right now, you, you know, you have access to all this vast knowledge of, 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 of you know, the data, the knowledge, the experience that you cannot really, um, you cannot really, when, when you were introducing me, you said, you know, this is the people that know everything. It's impossible to know everything. Even the top experts these days very much recognize that the, the, the field is developing so fast and it became so fragmented that you really, you can be an expert in something very, very small. Um, I think what, it, what the Valley, as well as many other technology leaders around the world are really worried about is a little bit of, uh, of this negative backlash that may come too quick because of our inability to understand this technology at the moment. At the moment, we are like many of you probably have seen uh, the latest Disney movie, Moana. So I feel a lot of technologists are a little bit like those you know, Polynesian people on a small canoe using just the stars navigating the waters, the vast waters of technology. So that's where we are going. And the fact is that if we start putting limitations um, early on, that will perhaps prevent us from, from, uh, from advancing fast, advancing inclusive enough on all these technologies. Um, just this morning, I woke up to the news, by the way, personalized news feed, also powered by AI. Uh, but the, the story that just uh, caught my attention was a story about a Nobel uh, Prize winner, the economist, who was giving a speech in Norway, I believe it was yesterday, on a panel. And to demonstrate, the, you know, it was, it was something about the future of humanity. And he decided that he will ask the Siri, his assistant, uh, on, on, like about the weather or something. And his Siri was personalized to have a male voice. So the, the moderator caught up on it and said, why, why your Siri is male while the you know, majority of the, is, is the female assistant? And, and the professor, just as a joke, said something, well, you know, I tend to trust the male voice more than I trust the female. <laughs> and this just went viral. And then there was all types of comments. And the, you know, I, I'm not defending what he said or he has not said. What I'm just trying to get at is that we do not necessarily need to associate AI, the technology, to the social conversation that it has not necessarily anything to do with the phenomena. But it's very easy to conflate everything and then, you know, by, by just having a very, uh, you know, gender-driven conversation, all of a sudden the tech is now involved in it and, and the perception of technologies may be overshadowed and so on. So that's what, what I, I think worries a lot of the tech leaders. Okay. Um, well, I, I think what Daniel, if I summarize, what you're saying is, you talked a bit about technical side about AI, but you actually talked about what actually a lot of people talked about around artificial intelligence, actually what it really means for us. But you're also saying that we cannot really be afraid and not do anything about it because we also let, we need to let the technology develop itself and see how far it goes. But having said that, as a human being, as a humanity, we're still very afraid of the new technology. And if we look at it from the technical, oh, technical point of view, uh, whenever these new technologies come about, you know, governments and policy, they need to do something about it. Which actually you know, goes naturally to my next question to uh, Urs, is that, you know, Urs, you are actually not only direct, executive director for this uh, center at Harvard, but you're also, uh, by train, a professor of law. Uh, do you know any discussions globally that is being uh, discussed about what kind of structure, laws or legal structure that we need to have 
uh, or any examples of nation states that are preparing well for this AI technology and how it should be developed, how it should be controlled by the government, or how it should not be controlled by the government, and whatnot. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, great and wonderful to visit Seoul and uh, be <coughs> together today. Um, so if I may, to take two steps back and then um, respond to your question, also actually building up on uh, Daniel's uh, contribution. I do think uh, it's still, uh, we are still, as a society, including policymakers, we're still in a very early phase of really trying to understand what's going on. And uh, Daniel made this point, right, that in fact, many of the technologies that we're using every day, the Siri example, uh, or uh, Google search engine, right, that these technologies or these applications already have AI techniques and methods that power them. Um, and yet, for many of us, if we know about it, uh, it's some sort of a black box. We actually don't uh, understand even these um, applications that are already on the market right now. And as we all know, and as you pointed out, of course, the technology is evolving very quickly. Now we're talking about self-driving cars. We're talking about autonomous weapon systems. We talk about using AI technologies in courts uh, for sentencing and the like. So, so this is just at the beginning of what the technology will be doing to us or with us or for us. Uh, but actually, we, we don't really understand even the the practices that are implemented today. And I think that's a, a tremendous problem from a policy perspective, that we have a knowledge gap, uh, information asymmetry, between the very few people in usually very big companies um, developing AI technologies and applications on the one hand side, and the large population, the masses of people who are affected by the technology, but actually don't really understand how it works, including uh, the decision makers in, in the public sector. So to me, this is kind of a, a, a really baseline challenge that many countries and many policymakers uh, face, um, that you know, there is an information symmetry. The second challenge, where we're also in a learning process, including policymakers themselves, is, okay, the um, AI technologies can be used uh, for, for, and can foster the social good. They can be used to really achieve uh, global goals, right? So there um, are these um, uh, global sustainable development goals, as an example, uh, where there is a, a lot of conversation now how AI technology can be used uh, to improve global health, uh, or how it can be used to improve education, how it can improve our transportation systems, and so forth. So the technology has tremendous promise and potential. Um, but at the same time, as, as Daniel also mentioned briefly, there are, of course, also concerns <coughs> and risks. And I hope uh, you will, will talk a bit more about also um, how we think about the risks. And so, one challenge that policymakers face is how do we evaluate uh, 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 the benefits and the risks, and how do we balance these two things? And as a society, we will have to make hard choices in some cases. Um, uh, and we haven't really figured out you know, our ethics around some of these uses of technology. And uh, policymaking without understanding what's really going on and without really understanding how we value or assess the thing that is going on is very tricky. Um, and to make hard choices from a normative perspective becomes quite challenging. And then the last point I want to make is even if we understand what's going on, let's assume, right, as we learn quickly, hopefully, even if we have a good conversation at many levels, how we think about the different manifestation uh, of AI systems in practice, um, then what do we do about it? Because we are now looking at a, a set of, of, of technologies that uh, may require for very different governance models uh, than <coughs> previous uh, technologies that, that we adopted. And so that's the 
perhaps biggest challenge, right? Also to figure out, now circling back to your question, which of these issues that emerge from the use of, of new technology have to be addressed at the global level? Which issues can be dealt with at the local or regional level? And of course, that's particularly challenging because AI is now almost touching upon every aspect of life. So there's a lot of homework to do and a lot of thinking that needs to happen. Now, the last bit, just in a response to your question is, yes, I, I, I feel there are many nations having these debates. There was a, a big conversation actually in the US over the past two years, um, driven by the White House largely, but also working closely with industry and academia. Uh, we've seen in Japan a big uh, report um, that was published on AI and the human society that is very influential and does some mapping. Um, there are conversations, of course, in Europe going on there with a stronger focus on, on regulation, actually, than, than elsewhere. Uh, so these conversations are happening. But yet again, uh, it's very early stage. And uh, I, I do not think we're at the point yet where we can draw conclusions. Yeah. OK. Um you know, we, when we talk about the artificial intelligence, because it is, we are actually swamped by news and events and uh, the things that is involved in everyday life that we think it's all always involved or related to artificial intelligence, that we think it has advanced a lot already and we really need to be, sometimes be afraid of it. And you, Daniel mentioned about, you know, is it going to be another Terminator story? Uh, but it seems like that it really is an early stage, and we have actually no idea how it's going to actually develop. One of the reasons why we are having these type of uh, conversations and the fact that we're having it in Seoul is a, is a great opportunity for having these uh, global experts to talk about uh, this issue and continue to do so throughout the world and throughout the rest of the year, and really excited about what's uh, going to come out out of these uh, series of dialogues. Now, it leads to the next question to actually Professor Umegaki. Professor Umegaki is not an expert on artificial intelligence, like myself. But I believe Professor Umegaki is probably one of the right or the best persons in this panel to talk about what the development of artificial intelligence really means for general public, what it really means for just for you and me, just regular citizens, what it means for our society. So professor, yes. if you may, please. Okay. Um, touch upon this point. I guess my uh, position is more like a reluctant consumer <laughs> of a uh, changes that, are, that have been advocated. And uh, I'm a trained political scientist, and uh, my interest has been always history. So not exactly sort of uh, anywhere close to AI specialists one way or the other. But uh, from that perspective of my being political scientist and historian, I have one thing in common. I have one very interesting sort of uh, puzzle I always wanted to so, sort of uh, see the answer to. People do talk about three or four industrial revolutions. They talk about changes. But in the important point is people also absorb those changes, three, four major industrialization. And for a human being to absorb these such a huge, huge uh, changes. So my interest is more of our ability to absorb or ignore the changes rather than how people make those changes. That's the sort of perspective I'm to talk about. And uh, for example, I'm having a difficulty with this particular technology. It doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it did. Okay. Nope. Okay. I'd like you to take a look at it. I'm trying to uh, bring everyone here on the same terrain so that not just me, uh, people sitting here, but everyone start thinking and, uh, so that we can actually discuss. This is a representation of earthquakes and possibility of earthquakes in Japan. In the past 20, 30 years, we've, we've had constantly earthquakes. 
The one you are familiar with is the one in 2011, the uh, magnitude of nine or above. Okay. Now, 2014, the uh, Weather uh, Bureau announced the possibility of likelihood of a major earthquake over uh, magnitude six or, or more taking place within 30 years. 2014, they said 78% uh, in Yokohama and 73% in Chiba and 46% in Tokyo. When you hear these figures, what do you think? What do you do? Are you going to run? Okay. Then 2017, the figures were a little worse than 2014. 81% for Yokohama, 85% for Chiba, and 47% for Tokyo. Chiba, by the way, is the place where the uh, international airport is located. So from here, I'd like you to take a look at this one. This is the people moving from a rural area to major city areas. And when you, if you look at it, Tokyo, nothing happened. The new information about possible changes, no one care about it. So 2011, major earthquake took place in farther north of, of Tokyo. And uh, partly because of the, the, the influence on uh, the, uh, damage to a nuclear power plants, not far from here. Everyone started talking about it. we have to do something about it. We have to do something about it, but have we done anything? That's the major uh, puzzle I'd like to think about. So nothing happened in terms of the movement of people. People continue to love big cities, from rural area to the major city areas. People continue to move. So we added, uh, I added a little different sort of a statistic. These are the locations of the nuclear power plants. And the ones with the smaller uh, circles, the circle means a 20 kilometer radius, and the big one, 100 kilometer radius. Japan continued to rely heavily on the uh, nuclear uh, energy, and uh, mainly because we don't have any, any other sources of energy. We import close to 98% of the oil, and so we have to rely on the nuclear power. So when you look at the, the figure on the left, Japan continues to buy or build more nuclear power plants. Currently, only two power plants are, are working since 2011 because of the incident. Okay. Do these change, are these changes absorbed by the Japanese in terms of the movement from rural area to big cities or from big cities to other parts of Japan? Nothing happened. So this is one sort of puzzle I would like you to think about. Okay. And somewhat uh, closer to home, not in a, in a big, big sort of gigantic mega theater of a earthquakes or a uh, nuclear power plant issues, something much closer to home. Because this is the figure of a people who have had a handicapped uh, children as their first or second uh, children. Okay. I did with, uh, with uh, my colleague from Vietnam, we did the research over 10 years, and uh, this is one of the findings we had. A number of handicapped children after one handicapped child, you would think that the parents try not to have more children. But having one handicapped children simply does not change their reproductive activities. Why not? So you start wondering, just having one is not a strong, strong deterrent enough. Maybe a, what about two? A number of handicapped children after two handicapped children. No, that two doesn't work as a deterrence to the parents for having more children. The only deterrence these families had against having more child 
is the number of children rather than what children are like, but the number of children, the size of the household. Economy determines more their behavior. And this is just a sort of one example we need to think about. Now, one thing I, I just wanted to add about this is just that this is what happened. This is, these are, oops, come on. These are the three areas I did the research. And uh, these three areas are known for a storing or using the, uh, uh, the what was that, Agent Orange. This is a deforiant during, during Vietnam War. And the children, the handicapped children are the victims, or considered victims of the parents or one of the parents exposed to uh, uh, Agent Orange, which has produced so much dioxin. And the group that I just showed is our fr the family, the, the, the group of families I showed was from Phuket, which, by the way, was where the major uh, Korean forces were located during Vietnam War. The point is very simple. Um, whoops. The, regardless of the causes of handicapped children, Parents simply do not react or as much sensibly to having handicapped children. They continue to produce children or they continue to want to have children. So what does this mean? This is what I wanted to sort of talk about. We've been exposed to all kinds of signs of changes, but we tend to sort of try, either ignore it or try to absorb as, of those, those changes as if nothing happened. So when we think about our uh, more ordinary people's attitude toward the signs of changes or efforts to change, first thing we have to make sure is how do you sell the changes? And in what, what kind of uh, um, mind frame you, uh, you need to work on? And this is what I think what happens. This is a very simple sort of a diagram I came up with using the uh, more of a behavioral economist idea. Okay. To, on the horizontal line, it's just a sort of investment for change. You want to invest, you want to do something for change. The result is the vertical line. The effort will be rewarded with a little bit of gains, a little bit of a sort of reward. But usually, our efforts will, will not be rewarded, awarded with the sort of uh, proportionate sort of uh, gains from it. You try a little harder and a little harder, only after a while, your efforts for change will be awarded. Okay, that's the sort of a broken line shows. We try to figure out, in the meantime, how, would it, how do we react to the initial efforts? To, we try to do something, to change something, you don't get any result yet. Usually, we give up because we feel like it's wasted. Okay, so, um, oops. this is the line of our own behavior, usually. We try to figure out, if I want to change my, my way of living, do I get the immediate result for it? Usually, we don't. You'll take one try, two tries, three tries, four tries, fifth tries, maybe seventh tries, tenth tries, you begin to see some reward going up. In the meantime, we were always under the pressure of trying so hard without any, any sort of results, without any sort of return for it. So our, our tendency is we figure out, in the end, we follow the usual. Just, whoops. See the problem with the technology I have refused to accept. I can. Are they? Okay, basically, this is it the, the basic picture. We try to change ourselves, initial tries for a while, we don't get any reward for it, so we give up then go back to the, the usual way of living. That's the sort of uh, a cat 
try and figure out first. Then in the end, it's so hard to see the result of your efforts, go back to the usual cat falling asleep. That's more like the sort of uh, representing the sort of reluctant consumer on our part whenever we see some sort of uh, promises of change. That's how I see it. So basically, that's a sort of uh, the situation, that's the sort of a ordinary people's sort of response to any signs of major changes in the past. I'm not saying that ordinary people are not rational. They are perfectly rational. rational. But just because they are rational, they, they may not respond to the plea for better change, to the plea for more changes. That's how I see it. Well, I think that was very deep, deep explanation of what artificial intelligence, the, the, or answer to the question that I had, what artificial intelligence means for our society. Basically, I think what Professor Umegaki, if I may, is trying to uh, tell us is that, that this is a big change that's gonna happen, or we're expecting a huge change through this new technological development, yet, if I may have heard it correct, correctly, that although we might think that there's huge change, our behavior-wise, mm -hmm. we might not do anything different because it'll all come to us very naturally. However, however, but I still have to ask questions, so maybe one of you two can answer is that, you know, when we talk about the artificial intelligence and when we talk about the automations and all these efficiency-driven you know, practice in private sectors. We always hear about how these new technologies, especially driven by artificial intelligence, will replace our jobs, for example. You know, if we lose our job, I don't think we can stay as a reluctant consumer because we won't be able to consume anything. I think having a job is one of the most important part of our life. And in Korea, actually, the job, the unemployment rate, especially among the youth, is all-time high, and the government is scrambling around how to resolve this, yet they also have to accept this new technological change that we need to do something about in order to stay ahead of uh, this technological sector so that we can stay competitive as a nation in the global stage. So we are actually in the dilemma of we need to invest more and obviously want to be advanced in this technological development, yet we're so afraid of this development at the same time because we are already seeing the signs actually in some sectors that these changes is bringing hardship to our future generation. So how do we answer that question? I mean, at the World Economic Forum, I know we talk about you know, all the issues around how can we, as a, you know, as a global society, to tackle these type of changes. And while we celebrate these good things, we also really need to touch upon what we can do to make sure that these changes can be uh, advanced, maybe at a pace that we can accept so that we don't have to feel the changes, that we can accept as a naturally. Is there any practice or any global dialogue structure that you know of, Daniel, that is actually talking about this type of issue, especially around artificial intelligence? So absolutely, we at the World Economic Forum are really paying attention to those types of conversation because our motto is entrepreneurship for a global public good. We always try to bring public, private, and civil society together to advance those type of conversation. We are increasingly trying to utilize our platform for real impact. So just as a matter of fact, in Davos uh, a few months ago, the technology leaders of about 50 largest companies, technology companies around the world, came together and said, we really need to do and collaborate us. Although we are competitors in the marketplace, we need to collaborate around the whole jobs and skills uh, issue because this will affect us all and we have an obligation to the society to do that. Um, so we will be doing it from the technology industry point of view. We will be developing such a platform in the next couple of months. We're hoping to announce it in September. 
at the UNGA in, in New York. So you're gonna announce it in, during the UN General Assembly? That's right. In New York? That's right. Is it part of the UN process? It's, it's, we'll use, use the fact that all the global leaders are in New York that week to actually make an announcement because we're gonna have our own little gathering there as well. So you're saying basically even the United Nations is actually thinking and worried about yes, this type absolutely. of development. Exactly. As a matter of fact, there are certain uh, sprouts of mm -hmm. innovative thinking at the UN level as well. There is something called World Artificial Intelligence Organization that has been created just a few weeks ago uh, and is now gathering speed. But let me go back to Professor's point. I, I love to, I myself, I'm a technology geek, but also a big history fan. And um, I think one thing that it's very easy to forget is that as a human society, we've been here before. Uh, you know, I love the saying that technology is not, is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Mm. Uh, and if you think about it, um, let, let me tell, actually, tell, let, tell you an actual story from 1800s, late 1800s, when Harold's department store in London was the second place on earth that introduced escalator, you know, the self-moving stairs. The first one was actually introduced in Coney Island in New York. So back then, it was such a technological advancement. It was tremendous, right? Nobody has ever seen self-moving stairs. And there were a lot of questions around, will it display some jobs around, you know, now that automation is coming, it will take our jobs away. As a matter of fact, not only it didn't displace anyone's jobs, but the Harold's department store had to hire two additional headcounts to place on the top of the stairs to greet terrified customers that were coming off this self-moving stairs. The ladies would get a little bit of a smelling salt and gentlemen would get a shot of sherry <laughs> to you know, lift the spirits. Now, as many of you may still hope for a shot of sherry every time you take an escalator <laughs> these days, the, you know, society just accepted this as a change, right? Mm -hmm. Um, another thing what I want to say, a lot of analysts say that the potential of artificial intelligence to bring transformative change to society is only comparable to the change that electricity brought to the society in the beginning of the 20th century. Now, you or all of us don't really need to be electrical engineers to understand how electricity works, to actually just flip the lights on or power our laptops or anything like that. So I just wanted to cautious us about getting too hyped in the fact that the change will be so disruptive that we really need to do something now. We absolutely need to start preparing for the change, but to, to the professor's points, it's, uh, um, we cannot be a lazy cat that goes back to sleep, but at the same time, we shouldn't be all uh, hyperactive around the risk side of this. Yeah. Okay, I mean, you're obviously, I mean, given that your job and your taking care of all these technology companies, so you need to be, maybe stay positive about these developments. I, I understand that, but let me, let me be the bad guy here. <laughs> I mean, I am also interested in these you know, developments because I myself just started a PhD program at KAIST because I really want to learn and be ready uh, as a policymaker, as a former policymaker, how we can prepare for these changes and what it's gonna do for the society, but yet, the changes that we're talking about, and like I said before, the, the signs that we're seeing, and given all these, these you know, s numbers that we've seen, and I've given you an example about the unemployment rate that we think is, is because of this technological advancement. And also, Urs, you said before that, you know, uh, and what you said before comments, and I, I, it brings me a one story, I think I read it in an article, that Google, for many, many years, have tried all their engineers, the best talents, were sent to their, uh, I believe, data center, because data center is the biggest cost for expense for Google, because I guess they use a lot of electricity, and their single job was to make sure that, figure out how to lower the cost. And one day they gave that to their artificial intelligence, the AlphaGo, and AlphaGo has figured it out so that when they tried it, it has dropped the electricity expense by 40%. And the problem of that article was that 
while they were happy about the fact that they were now spending 40% less on the electricity bill, they could not figure out how ARPAGO has figured out to lower the cost. Now, before, all we had to do is take the car, take the radio, and sort of break it and open it up and see what happened, re-engineer it, right? But now, we have absolutely no idea, and we're talking about the best minds in this field saying that they have absolutely no idea how AlphaGo has figured this out. And if we're seeing that already in this beginning stage, if AlphaGo has really advanced into something that we cannot then absolutely have no idea to figure out, how can we trust what it's thinking? How can we trust that it's not really doing anything bad behind our back to you know, destroy us, maybe, worse? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this question of transparency and accountability of the algorithms and uh, the question whether we can explain uh, what's happening within the black box, these are some of the really hard cross-sectional um, cross-cutting uh, questions, whether we're talking about healthcare or um, transportation or any other application that is built up on AI, uh, AI technology. And uh, it's interesting, so in Europe there is um, a new um, regulation uh, taking um, effect relatively soon that has a pro the general data protection regulation that has a provision in there that uh, if you as a subject, as an individual, um, if you're um, uh, confronted with a, a system that processes data automatically and then also makes decisions based on, on the analysis of, of your data, um, that you have a right to um, get an explanation what has happened uh, in the processing itself. Right. And so um, it's kind of interesting that the policy and lawmakers assume, right, they, they agree that it is important to somehow open up this black box, but the assumption is from the legal and policy side that you can really understand what's happening in the black box. But as you're suggesting and pointing out, it's not so simple from an engineering and computer science perspective. And so it's actually, um, that we will see a lot of creative thinking that is uh, necessary uh, and also experimentation um, to build systems in parallel that are able to explain what the AI uh, system uh, uh, that leads to certain decisions is actually doing. So that's not a trivial problem. And here again, we see this knowledge gap between what policy makers think may be a, a, an easy fix for it, yeah, just create a new law, but then the computer scientists say, wait, well, at the moment, in the age of machine learning, uh, we have a hard time to really understand what's happening in the black box, if, if possible to explain at all. Now, the, the, the other thing I just want to say in response to, to Daniel's comment and, and your earlier question about labor, as we ha as we're having these discussions also about uh, our adaptability and how are we as societies um, mm -hmm. willing to engage with, with change and, and innovation, I, I do believe it's worthwhile to understand that AI is not this one thing. Um, AI, in fact, is actually a set of tools and, and methods um, from you know, speech recognition to image recognition to translation techniques and so forth. And so, particularly when it comes to regulation, uh, uh, but also to these policy questions about the impact on, on, on labor and the future of work, I do think we have to be um, quite contextual and, and look more carefully what type of AI-based technology is deployed in what area and what are then the challenges both in terms of labor um, or in, in terms of these broader policy questions. So to give an example, if an AI-based technology is applied um, uh, to, to analyze uh, x-rays, right? something that a radiologist would usually do. It's very likely that the radiologist's job will be gone. Will be gone 
in a few years, right. or you know that it may change and 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 adapt, and maybe there is a version to combine what AI is doing really well uh, uh, with the human knowledge that the radiologist has. But definitely, you have a problem. You see similarly the impact of AI in the financial industry as an early adopter, when it comes to repetitive tasks previously performed by humans. There can be little question that AI will have a huge impact on the future of these jobs. But then there may be other areas where you know, AI-based technologies are at work, but are more supporting human judgment. Or um, think about uh, 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 judges. I, I, I don't think that in, in areas where we have to um, where we need different skills and attitudes, that the impact will be the same as in the category of very repetitive, relatively mm. standardized tasks, where it's also clear what the right or wrong outcome is. Mm. And so my suggestion is to, to be relatively nuanced in these debates and not look at AI as the one thing that uh, kills all the jobs, mm. right? It, it really depends. And you can see a world where actually AI will, will um, lead to more jobs uh, because we may get smarter about uh, analyzing problems or solving right. problems through data, through algorithms, but then we have to take action based on it. Mm. And so you could see that entirely new jobs uh, and industry emerge uh, as in your escalator uh, <laughs> example, right? And so uh, also that reminded me, and this was also an important point also in your presentation, that of course we should also be careful not to look at governments just as a regulator. Mm -hmm. uh, I think governments, and, and this conversation brings that up, can play many different roles. Governments can have a role of an educator. Mm -hmm. uh, governments can be supporters of technological change. They can play a role also as a, an investor in, in research and development. Um, and, and of course, uh, in, in, in increasing skills and literacy levels. So that's perhaps also a second thing to keep in mind. Um, again, the role of governments is also more nuanced, and this employment skill question is a great example. Okay. Can I pick yeah. up on something we said? Because that's, I think, it's very important. So part of my family is in media business. And I was chatting to some of the media executives recently, and something that one of them said really struck me as potentially very true. Do you know what the most feared task of a reporter is? It's Re either... The journalism? Yeah. Okay, I don't know. It's either a sporting event or a company reports. Because there is no inspiration in it, right? You just give the score. Or you just say, you know, the company's stock went up, went down. So now think, in many places, that job has already been automated. AI does it. AI just fills, it listens to the score, it fills in the report, it goes away. The same for, for company reports, right? It's very basic, simple uh, task. Now, what does it mean? It means that all those journalists that spend time doing that, they're not fired. No, but they have time to now to spend on the quality journalism, on investigative journalism, on something on story writing. It's the same way when the early jobs that were very repetitive got automated on the assembly line. And that allowed us to be more creative in terms of our physical activity. I feel in a way the cognitive revolution will get rid of a lot of repetitive cognitive tasks. Back to my example, I don't remember any phone numbers anymore because I don't have to. But that allows me to be a little bit more creative on the other side. Okay. Well, um, we are running about, we have done about 60 minutes. Uh, I think we can go about another 15, 20 minutes. Uh, right now, I'm going to ask Professor Umegaki a question. But meanwhile, and I hope Professor Umegaki can answer that within only in five minutes, uh, not too long. But maybe meanwhile, uh, if anybody from the floor, if you have any questions, please, please prepare and ask any of the panelists, including ourselves. So my, my question to Professor Umegaki, again, I'm going to be the bad guy here. Uh, the recently, I think everybody read it in the world, but you know, I read Sapiens. 
uh, you know, I read it because I guess Bill Gates said it's a great book, but no, it was actually a good book. Uh, he talked about at the end of the book how the, the humanity has, uh, there is a chance that our humanity, as we know, has run its course. And that maybe we are going to see the entire new, even species, the possibility of seeing entire new species uh, at the end of you know, some time in the future. And you know, maybe artificial intelligence maybe has something to do with, because I, when I talk to people, they are afraid that this has to do something with the end of humanity as we know. Now, you talked about the changes, and that people will accept these changes as we go along, but yet, the risk of accepting these changes as we go, as everyday life, is sometimes really high. And looking at the example that you provided, which is the earthquake at, you know, uh, Fukushima earthquake, there always was a chance of having a huge earthquake, but they lived with it. But the, the consequence of that earthquake was tremendous, not only for Japan, but for entire global economy at the time, I remember. So I think just accepting change because we cannot do anything about it and live our life the day as it, it is and not preparing anything is a huge, or could turn into a huge mistake. Mm. Okay. What do you think, Professor? Um, I'm trying to uh, convert myself into more of a positive consumer okay. <laughs> of your changes. But the metaphor, that I use the handicapped children, the parents, that's right. more of a metaphor in that um, parents of handicapped children, for them, the major concern is to have a family. If they decided not to try to have a child, meaning that they're not going to have, the chances of getting a healthy child is 100% gone. So, but if they try, then chances of getting a handicapped children can be also high. But at least they have some chances left to have a healthy child. So that's the gamble that they did. And that is probably the kind of metaphor I can think about. In other words, or, or right, AI maybe, or AI and other things are constantly changing our life. Where do you want to absorb those changes and to positively contribute to that? Now, the first step will be change yourself first. And what are you? Okay, Bill Gates, whatever he says, he uses a big term like humanities, but we don't live by that, by that big, uh, big term. Sure. We live not by the forest we see, we live by the trees we see, and we are part of those trees. So self-realization of what I am can des decide where we can benefit the changes, where we can benefit from AI. But when we say humor here, for example, um, I sort of uh, feel very lonely for one major reason. I don't see anyone who looks older than 60. <laughs> and I'm 70. Then you start think, thinking about, in concrete terms, what you are, rather than as a cluster of individuals called humanity. You pay attention to the details. You pay attention to the trees first before you start looking at the forest. And that, I think that's also a metaphor, to turn ourselves into become a more consu the positive consumer, critical consumer of new changes. That's how I see it. OK. <laughs> Any questions from four? This is a very hard panelist to put together. <laughs> or even Professor Dr. Yoon, if you have any questions, or if you have any questions, that's fine as well. Anyone? Please. Is there any mic that uh, our guests can use? Hand the mic, is you hand the mic. Thank you for that discussion. I really enjoyed a um, uh, very uh, deep discussion on the AI. And my question Gentlemen, is, could, could you please uh, introduce yourself and where you're from, maybe? Right. Um, um, I'm from, um, my name is Tony uh, Choi, and I'm from the, the consulting uh, company uh, from the UK. 
Um, we are uh, focused on uh, the research and consulting projects on the digital transformation. And, and my question is, uh, right, because everyone is afraid of the impact of the AI in, in, in most of the countries. And so from the perspective of the government, so they see the people, uh, how much they are afraid of the AI, and they tend to be rather negative um, on the impact of the AI initially. So that means that there are to be a regulator then, the like, then rather than became, becoming a, the policy uh, changer or you know, the positive industry um, promoter. So it's like, well, from the experience and the cases you raised, um, the history, from the history. So there might be some changes with the technologies and you don't know how much, you know, will, will there will be an impact. And especially in the, the employment and jobs will be changed, of course. But the, the most of the, uh, the fear the, the people are now facing is that they think they lose their jobs but they don't really think about how the, the employment uh, environment will be balanced or not. So the question is, uh, how would you recommend to the government to see this problem? And uh, uh, from the negative uh, aspect, do you really need to uh, recommend them to be of value neutral uh, in terms of the, um, you know, the attitude and mindset of the the, uh, formulating the policies against it? That's my cousin. Uh, you want to take a stab at it? Well, uh, I agree. I, the, the, there, is, there is this com misconception or, or let's say one-sided perception of, of what this next generation of technology may do to us. Um, and, and I do feel that governments have a tremendous responsibility to communicate to the public, to the citizens, um, and share these positive stories as well, so that we are not kind of one-sided in, in the way we think um, about uh, AI. And, you know, uh, just there are so many use cases where, where, where the benefits of, of, of these technologies are, are so concrete, like think about AI machine learning systems that are better at detecting colon cancer on, on pictures, right, taken after uh, an endoscopy. Um, I mean, that's amazing, right? And, and you, you, there are many, many stories, whether you look at ways that uh, uh, AI-based technologies can help uh, to manage global, the spread of global health crisis and disease, whether you look at uh, how these systems make our airplanes safer, uh, how they contribute in many other ways to to well-being and, and how digital tutors may support the learning of, of, of people, of children living in areas where they don't have teachers otherwise, and so forth. So there are numerous, numerous, numerous positive stories, and we also have to tell these stories and document them and l learn about the conditions under which uh, these positive narratives are possible. So I couldn't agree more that it will be key uh, going forward um, to, to have a more balanced view and not to, to stay within this kind of threat scenario. And that's, uh, that's a true responsibility, but also a shared challenge where I think uh, the companies, the industry, uh, as well as governments and academia uh, have to, to play together to, to kind of you know, get towards a more nuanced understanding of, of uh, both the risks and the benefits. Professor Mugeki. Um, employment and new technology, it's a real uh, question, but at the same time, are we uh, assuming that employment opportunities is just one package and uh, new technology will eat it up? But the, when we look at, not the, the forest, but the tree, Japan, for example, 30% of the population is over 65, and sooner or later it's going to be 40, and 45, 50%. We're going to have a huge shortage of labor, huge shortage, a lot of employment opportunities. 
So when we talk about technology and its impact, negative impact being sort of taking the job opportunities away from human beings, that's a little too simplistic. So what we need to do is to get a pretty good idea. Number one, what is the percentage of the population going over 65? How healthy are they? What about the health? What about the sort of uh, social relationship of one individual having? You know, somebody maybe uh, the medical doctor having constant problem at home, cannot perform well in the, in, the, in the surgery. All kinds of factors are needed to be computed before one could say, here's technology versus here's the um, um, job opportunities. And that's the, the, I, that, that's one thing that you feel it very sort of uh, close to your home. I used to be able to run, run up two or three stories. I can't. Then you start wondering, I'm glad here's the escalator. That's how you see it. And everyone had certain, certain one problem or other in such a way that when you, you put them in one picture, there are plenty of job opportunities, not just any job, but very specific job opportunities. AI has been pro providing the very basic infrastructure to, to produce all kinds of technologies to meet sort of a customized situations needed um, by different types of individuals. So I don't really jump into the simple question, sort of zero-sum situation where technology versus human being constantly vying for a limited market. That's... Okay. Uh, any other... Question. <laughs> we have a question. Please state uh, where you are. Hello. And My name is Xian, and I come from Tencent Research Institute. Uh, and thank you for all the discussion. I totally agree with Professor Wu that the most challenging in front of us is the knowledge gap between all the different parts. And actually, we have, uh, since a month ago, we have done uh, survey inside our uh, inside Tencent and uh, w with the public. We have gathered uh, the 3,000 answers from Tencent employees and the public and then how, what, what do they think about AI and uh, what is their exception and understanding of AI at this stage. But um, when we have to answer, our question becomes, uh, so yes, it's very clear that there is a big knowledge gap now, but what can we do next? We want to build a bridge between the public, the government, and the industry. And most of the time, the government is equal to the public. So what can we do? Uh, what, what do you think is the right way to build that bridge? Thank you. OK, and we have one question from actually Dr. Yoon. So maybe we'll listen to that question as well. 네, 제가 그 여러분의 어, 여기 지금 학생들 굉장히 많아요. 그래서 제가 학생들을 대변해서 한 마디 그 어, 질문이 있습니다. 이게 지금 브리치 TV가 방송될 건데요. 그것 또한 학생들, 청년들을 위한 방송이기 때문에 학생들을 굉장히 궁금해하는 점이 하나 있을 거예요. 그게 뭐냐? 이 분들이 이제 사차 산업 뭐 이제 짊어지고 갈 분들 그리고 또 저도 한그 아이의 어머니로서 또 궁금한 점인데요 뭐냐 하면은 이분들이 이제 4차 산업혁명이 온다 그럼 AI 뭐 여러 가지 있겠죠 테크놀로지 메소드 좋습니다 그러면 이분들은 무엇을 중요시하면서 어떤 재능을 어떤 면을 well, I think that would, I think uh, Dr. Yoon's question is very important because, you know, we talk about the technology development and what it does for our lives today, but we also need to talk about how we need to prepare our next generation in terms of their education to prepare this new world. Uh, so I, maybe a question from the lady from the floor, uh, either Urs or Daniel, go first. You, would, would you like to answer? And then maybe... <laughs> For uh, Dr. Yoon's uh, question, maybe Professor Umegaki can answer. Did you understand the Dr. Yoon's question? I couldn't, I couldn't catch it. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Yoon's question is, how can we prepare next generation in terms of education system for this new 
uh, technological uh, changes. Let, let me perhaps jump in very quickly first, okay, and then, and then uh, if you don't mind, um, just to your question. Uh, when I was uh, when I was in China more than 15 years ago, it was completely cash-based society. You had to have cash for everything. Not only you had to have cash, you had to have a small change if you wanted to buy like you know mandarins or anything like that on the streets, or and you had to have a bigger bills to pay for a restaurant and so on. Now. You guys completely skipped the whole credit card system because you went to the, directly into mobile payment. Now, did it happen, that breach, did it happen by design, by just the good fortune of forces aligning? It's a big question, right? Uh, to Dr. Yoon's point, I, I actually don't think we need to prepare our future generations. I think you know, we don't need to teach them. They will teach us because they grew up in this environment naturally. They intersect, inter, you know, interact with this technology by playing with it. There's a saying that if you want to understand what is the water, do not ask the fish, because you, know, you just really have to, you wouldn't be able to tell you what it is, right? It's, it, you, you, you just, it's part of a natural environment. Um, we, as a human beings, just generally tend to overestimate the impact of technology, of any technology, not just AI, in the short term, and completely underestimate the impact of technology long term. This is perhaps what I... That's a very dangerous comment, by the way, to say <laughs> in Asia. <laughs> because we usually do not accept the fact that our kids can tell us what to do. I, Although my five-year-old does tell me what to do all the time. But anyways, <laughs> that being said, uh, would you have any comments, Professor? Yeah, also in response, uh, I mean, I, I could go on for a long time, but I'll try to be very brief and just highlight two things we could do, among many other things. On the one hand side, and that's something uh, we are experimenting with at the, at the Berkham Klein Center at Harvard right. in collaboration with the MIT Media Lab, and that is to bring m early on uh, people from different disciplines together at our universities. So, in other words, that the engineers and computer scientists are also exposed to ethics and to policy questions and legal questions as they uh, start to study their field and become professionals. So that's kind of one possible intervention that can uh, help to uh, bridge the gap between the different disciplines, especially when it comes to the next generation of, of leaders. Another um, second, I think, promising avenue is to leverage digital technology to reach broader audiences. Um, as you pointed out, this is recorded today and maybe some students will, will watch it. And I think we, as, as, a, as people who, who share this um, uh, a sense of importance of education, we can use digital technology uh, to reach new audiences, to, um, to be become better teachers, to engage in some sort of translation from findings from science and make them more accessible. Um, and that is very, very exciting, and I think we're just at the very beginning to understand uh, how we can leverage technology towards these educational ends, and makes me excited, so. Okay, last comment from Professor Umegaki. Um, I don't know how one can do this, but I think there are some universities or in some countries have started doing this. Basically, the purpose of education is to enrich the language that students can use. When you have enriched language, you can see more things more clearly. When you don't have the rich language, what you see is also very limited. That's a sort of a symbolic interaction is sort of approach. But in order to enrich your language, how do you do it? Sometimes you go abroad, not necessarily. By going abroad, you have become just a tourist. You are not enriching the language. So somehow that experience of actual different places and different languages incorporate both into your thinking process. That's a whole uh, process that is needed to uh, enrich anybody's sort of language in such a way that enriched language leads them to see things more in an enriched manner, to see things, again, from different uh, sort of perspective, uh, different from uh, somebody who has very poor uh, language, okay? And that's how I see it, and uh, in, in case of the Korea or Japan or Taiwan, we have a very similar, I think, the university system. That's where it has to start. 
the first approach is to drop all those entrance exam uh, things. And that really is the worst uh, problem. And uh, if possible, uh, the old style, the, the national government should provide a lot more subsidies for the education hmm. without any strings attached, if that's possible. Very if not, progressive then policy. the business people would have to take over that responsibility. And that's where the real strength of any sort of uh, group, I won't call country, but a group of uh, younger generation uh, should lie. Um, very progressive thoughts, as I said. Uh, I think uh, this uh, college entrance exams and uh, trying to take it away actually completely from our system is being talked about in Korea for many, many years. And I think it's going to turn into or remain as a very hot issue to, uh, for time to come. I think we are about, I think we need to wrap up the session. Um, I really want to thank uh, our panelists, wonderful panelists that we have. Uh, it's really difficult to put this type of panelists together uh, and very honored that KGM Lab as our first exercise to put this, to get, put this symposium together and it wasn't possible, it wouldn't be possible without uh, help from uh, Harvard Berkman Klein Center. And at the same time, uh, Daniel and Professor Umegaki have provided uh, very deep insights of the issues that we talked about today. Um, again, I really want to thank all the audience. And at the same time, uh, again, I want to thank Dima uh, for putting this uh, session together. And we work uh, for allowing us to have this uh, or allow us to use this space for this uh, particular symposium. Um, we will have the private sessions in the afternoon. Uh, we'll have a very live discussions, and once we have it, uh, wrap it up at the end of this year, hopefully, that we'll be able to disseminate among everyone here. And if you have any questions, and if you want to see this uh, panel again, please visit our website at kgmlab.org. Uh, we'll be able to put up this video uh, within the next few days. Um, thank you very much uh, for sticking with us for a very, very long time. And hopefully, we'll be able to revisit you in the next few months with maybe more exciting and different topics. And we are, we'll be focused on not only on fourth industrial revolution, but other many different topics, uh, global issues, and especially on youth unemployment and what we can do for the next generation. Thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you. 네, 오늘 함께 해주셔서 감사하고 Hello. 비공개 토론에 초대되신 분들께서는 뒤쪽에 있는 비공개 토론장으로 이동해 주시기 바랍니다. 우리 여기서 사진 찍. 네, 지금 사진 촬영도 같이 한번 좀 우리 사진 한번 때문에 어, 네, 이쪽